And good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Richard Gearhart. You're watching a very special edition of KSBY News on Facebook. For the next 30 minutes or so, we will be talking in depth about what's happening in the Kristen Smart murder trial. We're calling this show Beyond the Headlines because we want to take you beyond the daily reporting and dig deeper into some of the issues surrounding this trial. It's a complex case, more than 26 years in the making, and there's a lot to talk about. So this will be our first special with many more to come as the trial takes place over the next few months. And so first we're going to get you up to speed on what's happened so far this week in court. Paul and Ruben Flores are charged in connection with the 1996 disappearance of Cal Poly student Kristen Smart. Paul, who was also a student at the time, is charged with her murder. His father, Reuben, is charged as an accessory, accused of helping her hide the body. Monday was the official first day of the trial. The prosecution presented its opening statements, and Paul's attorney, Robert Sanger, introduced his defense. But Reuben's attorney, Harold Meesing, did not get a chance to present his opening statement until yesterday morning. Court was delayed for two days because someone involved in that trial was ill. Once Misik was able to deliver his opening statement, it was time for testimony to begin. Kristen's mother, Denise Smart, was the first witness called to the stand, followed by her brother and her father. And we intended tonight's show to be live, but we are having some technical difficulties, so we pre-recorded and are coming to you a little later than we promised. Still, we'd like to invite you to share your comments and questions in the chat below. We'll be keeping track of all of them and compiling them for future episodes. And today, I'm going to take a deeper dive into the jury selection process specifically and the uniqueness of this two-jury system that we have in place for this case. And my guest tonight is Mary Wofford. And first of all, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, good evening, uh, Richard. Um, I was a DA in the Ventura County District Attorney's Office back in 1988. Mm -hmm. And I left uh, the Ventura DA's office in 1997. Okay. And then got a job in the Monterey District Attorney's Office and worked for Monterey District Attorney's Office for 22 years and retired last year. And now working with Jeffrey Stolberg here in San Luis Obispo as a co-counsel on a sexual harassment case. Perfect. All right. Well, congratulations on your retirement, or at least Thank your you. semi-retirement, because you're still working. Yes. And so you've been through this process before. Yes. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show is because I, you know, obviously been sitting in court, and I've covered court cases before. We've covered this case all along. I was working at the station when this happened, so I've, you know, followed this case from the very beginning uh, 26 years ago. But I've been sitting in court, and really there are some, uh, some things are catching me by surprise. I'm, maybe they shouldn't, but they are, right? And okay. so one of the things is this idea of jury selection. And I was really sitting in court. I was there for part of the jury selection process. And I was sitting in court thinking to myself, this is so important, right? Like the outcome of the case, the, really the lives of these two defendants are sort of hanging in the hands of these 12 people who are ultimately going to decide each of their fate. And it, and it occurred to me that we should kind of talk about this idea of jury selection. So uh, from an attorney perspective, what goes into jury selection? You know, jury selection, and I tell people, is the most important part of a criminal trial, and, and for that matter, for a civil trial. But in terms of a s criminal case, you're dealing with someone's freedom, and that's not to be taken lightly. And I always tell, when I was doing jury trials, I would tell jurors, you're the most important part of this whole process, because without you being involved in the process, we don't have a process. And so, uh, and it's, it, it is an inconvenience for the jurors because they have to show up, there's delays because there's some issues that come up between the lawyers and they have to be worked out outside the presence of the jury so they could be told to come back to court at 9.30 and court may not start until 10, until those issues are worked out. And, and I know uh, the Flores case, that judge is, I, I, we call, a working judge yeah. in that she takes care of other matters. Yeah, she, I, I, she was doing sentencing on last Tuesday when I was in Right, yeah. so she handles other matters before she starts that, uh, that jury trial. Yeah, and, and when I was sitting there, I was also thinking, you know, from the attorney perspective, watching the attorneys question uh, the potential jurors or, or talk to the potential jurors that, uh, you know, you know, I think I always think of law school as being prepared to try these criminal cases, doing the investigations, talking to witnesses, but selecting the jury is a huge part of it as well. How do you learn that part of it? You know, it, it, it's one of these things that uh, you're going to have to use uh, your instincts. Uh, you use your investigators. You use your experience. And you just have to stand up 
talk to the jurors, and if you're, as a prosecutor, as a former prosecutor, you're going in and you're looking for fair and impartial jurors. Because as a prosecutor, you know that your case is, you can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you don't know that, you shouldn't be standing up and asking 12 jurors to find a defendant guilty. So when you walk into the courtroom, and when I walked into the courtroom, I always felt, what an honor, what a privilege to represent the people of the state of California and to walk into a courtroom to do what's right and what's just. And you want to communicate that to the jurors during jury selection that, you know, we're looking for fair and impartial ju jurors. We believe in this justice system. It's the best justice system that we have in terms of, you know, all 12 of you have to agree that this man is guilty or this woman is guilty. It's not 50% of you. It's all 12 of you. You must reach a unanimous verdict. And then and talk, to, uh, first of all, about that, that idea of beyond a reasonable doubt, because it, it, when I was listening to some of the jury instructions, that even struck me, right? So the judge said not beyond any doubt, like there's always doubt in life. So what do we mean by reasonable doubt? Well, the law says that is an abiding conviction. And what I would say to jurors when I was doing jury trial is reasonable doubt, because you think, oh my God, a beyond a reasonable doubt, that's an impossible standard to reach. It's not. It's a standard that's met every day in courtrooms across America. Every day there's criminal trials and every day jurors are called upon to listen to the evidence and make a decision. And when, you, when we talk about reasonable doubt, every crime has elements. And in order for a juror to find a defendant guilty, each and every one of those elements must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So what a prosecutor, and I, do, I haven't followed the uh, SMART case, um, I'm sure there was PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, yeah, there were, yeah, yeah. And you list your elements, mm -hmm. and then you list what you believe the evidence is going to be. So if you can show uh, what the elements to each offense and the evidence, the facts that you believe you're going to be able to prove, you can prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt based upon the facts and the evidence. And in this case, the evidence, there is no smoking gun. There, that's what the defense said right away, right? Mm -hmm. There's no body, there's no smoking gun, there's very little forensic evidence. And so this is really about, and they talked a lot about this during the selection process, uh, they've talked a little bit about it, the judge did with the limited jury instructions given so far, is that this is an inferential case, meaning that you have to sort of infer. She even gave an example to the jury and she said, you know, uh, direct evidence would be, if somebody swimming in a swimming pool would be, you see them swimming and they get out of the pool, right? But also if you see a person get out of the pool, they have a wet bathing suit, they're wet, there's wet footprints leading to them, you know, beyond the pool that you can infer that they were obviously in the pool. And so that's what she was talking about in terms of inferential evidence. Is it harder to get juries to get to that reasonable doubt? Well, I think it depends on the presentation by the prosecutor. It's really going to be important for the prosecutor in a circumstantial evidence case to show the reasonable inference of the evidence. And they, they'll receive a jury instruction, and I believe it's uh, Cal Cram 223 or 224, and it talks about and it outlines uh, circumstantial evidence. And the court will tell, will read that instruction, and it, it depends on how the court decides to handle it. Sometimes the judges will read the jury instruction prior to the attorneys doing closing statements. Sometimes it's after uh, the attorneys have uh, presented their closing statements. But in any event, when the jury retires to the jury room, they'll receive a packet of jury instructions. And they can use all of those instructions or they can use those instructions that they deem um, are appropriate for the that case and the facts. Case. And so this, uh, the circumstantial evidence instruction, it can be confusing, but if you have an experienced prosecutor explaining that instruction, it's actually a very good instruction. And the instruction begins, it explains direct evidence, just as the judge explained. Mm -hmm. You see a person getting out of the pool, you know that they, that's direct evidence that they were in the pool. But, uh, and, and then the other examples yeah. that the judge gave of the, the footprints and the wet soup and the inference that you can make that they were in the pool, mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't see them getting out of the pool. And so um, the, the law says that circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence. It's just going to be incompetent upon the prosecutor to make sure that those inference and those steps. That the jury uh, can make those connections. Can make those connections. Yeah. And of course the defense is going to come back and say, oh, there's inconsistencies. 
that instruction goes on and um, to talk, the uh, circumstantial evidence. It talks about reasonable interpretations. And the law will say that if there's two reasonable interpretations of the evidence, in circumstantial evidence, if there's two reasonable interpretations, one pointing to innocent and one pointing to uh, guilt, they must adopt that the interpretation pointing to uh, uh, innocence, right? To innocence, yeah, because and find the, the defendant not guilty. So uh, you know, and I I wondered about that, and I wanted to kind of get your take on you know how good juries are at that, because there is this presumption of of innocence, right? And mm -hmm. in, in that's a constitutional guarantee, but. You know, I, I get this feeling like, you know, if people see uh, defendants being arrested or they see them on television, they know they're charged with crimes, that they're, that it's hard for people to sort of remember that presumption of innocence. I, I, I don't think so. I, uh, you know, uh, the judge will tell them, you know, as the defendant sits there, uh, he's innocent. And I don't know if the judge did this. No, yeah, she, she absolutely did. And she said, you know, just because a person's arrested, just because a person charges are brought against them, just because they've been in jail does not make them guilty. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, I, and from my experience, jurors really believe that. They listen to the evidence. They're tentative. And I don't know if this happened in the jury trial or not. Um, a lot of times, uh, the judges will not give the jurors notepads and pencils until after the opening statements, because the, the judge will tell the jurors, Opening statements are not evidence. Yeah, you know what she did, which I was, uh, which I actually was kind of surprised about too. You know, I've obviously been paying a little closer attention to this case, mm -hmm. and we have to travel up there, so I've got to drive up to Salinas, and you know, so I'm there in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. That's my undivided attention. But she said, "You have notebooks, and you can't take notes." But I want to point out to you that taking notes can distract you, and I'd rather you not take right. notes or write them down after the, the Right, and the thing with, uh, with this trial, there's a court reporter, so if they needed to have uh, something read back, they can simply send a note to the judge. Which he also pointed out to them too, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let, let's circle back uh, just for a minute before okay. I forget, honestly. <laughs> um, what is the actual process? Like how many uh, can jurors, as a prosecutor, can you remove from the panel if you will, how many can the defense remove? What reasons can you say you don't want the jury on the panel, et cetera? All right, now with, uh, in this type of a case, the Flores case, they have 20 preemptory challenges, okay. which means that they can excuse up to 20 people for no reasons for whatsoever. Now there's also, they can challenge jurors for cause. If a juror uh, during jury selection indicates that they're not gonna follow the law, that's a challenge for cause. Mm -hmm. And you just make a note, and when the defense finished speaking with the jurors, you approach, tell, and I don't know how the judge is handling uh, this process, you tell the judge, well, I want to challenge this person for cause, and then there's a discussion between the attorneys and the judge, and, and, um, and the judge will make the final decision as to whether or not it's a challenge for cause. Well, you know, and actually that's a good, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's a good point. You know, they have, and we, we, uh, we drew this kind of graphic there, and in between where the jury box is and the judge, mm -hmm. there's a, an exit to the courtroom there, and they actually walk back into the hallway when they're having those conferences. Mm -hmm. Is that typical? I mean, I've seen them walk, you know, approach the bench before, but they actually leave the room. Uh, yes, I was a prosecutor in Monterey, and it is typical. And the reason that, uh, that's done is so that the jurors cannot hear the discussion. Yeah. And so uh, even though the judge can turn off the microphone, for an, an, an important case like this, the Flores case, uh, the judge is not gonna make any missteps. She's gonna make sure that this case is handled properly. I mean, it's uh, predicted that it's going to take into October. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> uh, you don't want to make any sort of missteps. So that's very prudent of the judge to bring the attorneys into the back hallway, have that discussion there, and then they'll put it on the record outside the presence of the jurors. And during those discussions, just out of curiosity, what, what types of discussions are they? Like when you're talking with the judge, you know, what are you guys talking about? You're talking, well, you're, uh, it's usually an argument yeah. about uh, whether or not it's uh, a challenge for cause. Yeah. Because, of course, with the defense wants, they want you to use your peremptory challenges. So you they run out of them. So you run out of them. Yeah. And so, and of course, as a prosecutor, you want to excuse anyone that you have a feeling that's showing a bias, um, a motive. Um, that's not going to be fair and impartial. Mm -hmm. So when he, when uh, Chris Pravel, the 
deputy DA was actually mm -hmm. questioning the jurors. He was almost per, uh, sort of um, posing questions and then picking an individual juror and saying, you know, how would you answer this question? Or mm -hmm. asking them how their response to it, if you will. But, and he was asking questions like that, you know, can you infer from this? One of the things he was talking to the younger jurors about, which brought up a good point, right, is can you put yourself in a time back in 1996 when there weren't cell phones, when you weren't checking in with your mom every, mm -hmm. you know, w once a day, if not more often, when there wasn't GPS tracking. Is it, is that a reason to excuse a juror? I mean, I know that they weren't excused because I can see the jury, you know, there are some young people on there, but mm -hmm. people who are, say, in their 20s don't remember a time when there were no cell phones. Right, and, and that, that is, was very wise of the uh, DA to do that because you want to make sure that you have jurors that are, one, uh, going to be intelligent enough to listen to the evidence and understand that, okay, because uh, they may say, even though you're not supposed to bring in what you would do, you're to base your decision on the case based on the evidence that you hear in court. But you want to know, what is the background of that uh, juror? Are they going to be able to set aside their own, uh, what they would have done, and base their uh, decision based on the evidence that's presented in court and nothing else? So I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place here, but mm -hmm. it's kind of fun to, to talk to okay. attorneys about this process. Are there any types of juries? Are like are any uh, certain occupations that you really like to see in a juror? I mean, are you saying, oh, this is a teacher, and I, I like teachers, for instance? Or, I, you know, I it, it, it depends. Now, when I was a prosecutor in Monterey, there were certain people I didn't want on my jury. Yeah. You know, and um, and every prosecutor has, and, and it's not a bias, it's not a prejudice, it's just. Uh, you, you just don't want certain people. You know, sometimes you want more men. Sometimes you want more women. It depends on the type of case. You know, if you have a domestic violence case, you're going to want uh, more men. But, you, uh, but the bottom line is you want fair and impartial jurors. You want intelligent jurors. You want jurors who are going to pay attention. And most and foremost, you want jurors with common sense. Yeah. Because a lot of the case comes down to common sense. Look at the evidence. Look at what makes sense. Is there a ring of truth to what the testimony of each of the witnesses? Because you're gonna get that jury instruction that deals with credibility of witnesses. And it lists all the things that you can use to judge the credibility of the witness, the manner in which they testify, the knowledge that they have of, of the event that they were testifying to, um, do they have a motive, if there's a bias. All those things are very important in determining the credibility of witnesses. And so uh, the DA questioning the younger uh, jurors, do they have that ability to judge the credibility of the witnesses? You know, it's, uh, when you look at what's involved in this case, there's two men that are facing, I don't know if they're looking on the, for the death penalty on the case or yeah, if it's life in prison. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either, to be honest with you. Okay. So, yeah. And so when you look at it, you're looking at uh, taking the freedom of someone. I do know that because it's 25 years to life. life okay, so it's yeah. not a death penalty yeah, case. It's yeah. a, a life. Uh, so, um, you know, you're looking at someone going to prison for 25 years to life. So that's not something to take lightly. And, I, and it doesn't matter whether you're in a uh, murder case or a misdemeanor case. When you're taking the freedom of a citizen, it's very important that if you're standing up as a prosecutor and saying this person is guilty, that you believe that that person is guilty. We're watching like video right now of some of the players in the case kind of walking to the courtroom. We're not allowed to take video inside the courtroom while the mm -hmm. proceedings are going on. That obviously, as you know, is up to the judge. And she has ruled that there can only be still photographer, one still photographer who operates as a pool photographer, which means that we can all get the still photos from that person, but we're not allowed to take the jury. But I was also kind of surprised by this, right? So here's Ruben and Susan Flores walking in. He's out on bail. And so he's kind of standing there and the bailiffs are watching, right? But he's just in the hallway while they're waiting for court, you know, and we've all been instructed that we can't talk to him and he can't talk to us and he can't talk to any jurors, which my, may wonder by. They're obviously assembled in the jury room. But the first day there were some jurors who, you know, didn't know where to go and they're kind of, everybody's standing around, you know, uh, mm -hmm. is that pretty typical or is that from a smaller court? Smaller uh, well, uh, you're, the jurors are told not to talk to anyone and the defendants are told by their lawyers because the judge admonishes the lawyers to make sure their clients know not to talk to any jurors even if a, or or anyone in the courtroom uh, or outside of the courtroom if they walk up and want directions they're not to talk and so the attorneys are uh, the judges are very strict with that you are not to talk to anyone in uh, during this trial and so uh, while Mr. Flores is out on bail, he should not be talking to anyone. 
Um, and I haven't seen him talk to anybody, but I just it's it was sort of surprising, you know, that he doesn't have like a separate entrance or no, there's yeah. not a separate entrance they, because of security concerns. You have to go through the metal right. detectors. Yeah, and obviously we have to as well. You right. Know, so and then once I'm in there, it's hard for me to <laughs> go up because I know I'm going to have to come back to security. And and obviously as journalists, we're not allowed to leave uh, except for during breaks. Is that okay. is that pretty typical as well? Yes. And, you know, and in this case, um, maybe we can put the graphic back up because it's kind of fascinating. We haven't even talked about this yet, but we have this two jury system where the cases are being tried simultaneously, but mm -hmm. each of the defendants has a separate jury. And so there are 12 jurors and eight alternates mm -hmm. per jury. And right. so I think that that first jury box uh, holds about, we have the 12 seats in there, but I think it holds maybe three additional alternates in right, the jury they'll box. Right, uh, they'll put extra chairs. Yeah, and, um, but then, then in the front row of where it says extra jury, in the front row there are alternates for mm -hmm. Paul's jury, and then in the second, third, fourth, and fifth row are like where the, his jury sits, and there's alternates in the, in, toward the back okay. of that. So that entire, that one half section of the audience is where that extra jury plus the alternates mm -hmm. for Paul's jury sit. So is, does that make it more difficult? Have you ever been involved, or is it common to have two juries in one case? Uh, well, one, it's uh, more efficient that way because it's very expensive to put on a trial of this mag magnitude. And they're, they're the same witnesses, and it wouldn't make sense to have two separate jury trials because that would mean that uh, the witnesses would have to testify twice. So I see why they're doing the two jury uh, yeah. system. I understand why they're doing the number of uh, alternates uh, with illness, with COVID, with uh, life just happening, family emergencies. Uh, if you don't have enough uh, alternate jurors, if something were to go wrong between now and October, you would have to start this whole process. So that was gonna be my question, right? Because so far, uh, you know, while I've been involved in this trial, we're only in day, I think, three of testimony or something, right? Uh, one of the jurors has already been excused from Ruben's jury, from the father's jury, and they swore in an alternate. So now they're down to seven alternates. So if they run out of alternates, they do have to start all over again. Yeah. Wow. So the, my other question that keeps popping into my mind is what happens, you know, they're, they're been instructed not to talk to each other. The opening mm -hmm. statements were different. So uh, the DA's opening statement was almost given twice in a sense, right? I mean, it was mm -hmm. a very similar for both of the defendants. Mm -hmm. um, and then each of the defense attorneys responded with their opening statements. Mm -hmm. The judge said that they have their choice, right? The defense can either do the opening statement at the beginning. They don't have to do one at all. They can do right. one at the beginning of the trial or right after the prosecutors, or they can wait till the defense. What is, it, what is typical in that case? Do, do the, does the defense usually follow with an opening statement of the prosecutor? Generally, uh, they, they will follow with an opening statement uh, because the prosecutor has, uh, you know, the prosecutor has the burden of proof, proof beyond a reasonable doubt and they need to prove that uh, the defendant's guilty. And so the, the jurors have just heard all this uh, uh, evidence and they're all told that they're to um, look at the defendants as being innocent because that's constitution guarantee. Right. They're innocent until proven guilty. And so uh, the jurors just heard the prosecutor giving their opening statement, outlining what they expect the evidence to show, outlining who they expect to call as witnesses, uh, their expert witnesses, uh, any other uh, DNA evidence or, or whatever evidence they have. So the jurors have heard this evidence and they're like, hmm. And they're told, you know, you, you're not to, this is not evidence. The statements of the attorney right, is not that. evidence. She, she definitely told them that, yeah. And, but, you know, you, how can you not? Uh, hear so, and, this evidence. Right, and you know, and some of the things are, that are said in the courtroom, I'm wondering if that's part of the, I don't want to call it gamesmanship or something, or like the, you know, the, the sort of competition between the attorneys, but one of the things that uh, the defense attorney for Rubin said was when, before he gave a statement, he said, you know, I didn't really expect, I was expecting to give a 15 minute opening statement. I didn't expect the prosecution to be trying this case during his opening statement and now I need more time to respond. So if he says something like that in open court, the jurors are hearing that sort mm -hmm. of argument between the two attorneys. How much of that is sort of pre-planned? How much of that is acceptable? I think it's, it depends on who the defense lawyer, uh, you know, there's, I've had some pretty professional defense lawyers to work with. We can fight among ourselves. Uh, you know, because we both have our interests. You know, our my, my interest when I was a prosecutor was to make sure that um, the defendant that was standing in court, the verdict was guilty because the evidence in my judgment showed that that defendant was guilty mm -hmm. and, and he needed to answer for what he had done. Now, you can fight with one another, but you can fight professionally. Mm -hmm. And you can fight in a way where it's not... Um, 
it's not, it doesn't take away from the decorum of the courtroom and the decorum of, of the profession. Um, and I, I'm a little shocked that the yeah, defense that, yeah. lawyer uh, made that kind of a statement. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, I've been shocked by a couple of things. One of the things that, I mean, I expected this, but I was a little shocked that they went after the sort of character or reputation of Kristen Smart right away in the opening as well, saying, you know, that she was living an at-risk lifestyle and had a history of sort of disappearing mm -hmm. for the weekend. Is that is that odd that they would do that? Well, uh, in this case, I mean, that's the the basis of their defense, is that uh, she's just gone, if I understand correctly, is that yeah. she just disappeared, yeah. you know, and their client's not responsible for her disappearance. And so it goes back to what I talked about earlier about the credibility, you know? So they're essentially trying to put the victim on trial right now right. and take away from who's really on trial. And so the prosecutor's job is going to have to be to bring that jury back to, here's why we're here. Here's why we're here. Yeah. And so what if this is what she has done in the past, but we know that she didn't take off. We know that Mr. Flores killed uh, yeah. uh, Christian Smart. So uh, following up on my- Based on the this, Yeah, right, right. So following up on what I was trying to get to is that, is it possible or is there a scenario where Ruben's jury could find him guilty of being an accessory and Paul's jury could find him not guilty of murder? And what would happen in that case? Can you be an accessory to murder if there's not a murder? If you don't have a murder yeah. conviction, you're not gonna get an accessory. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering what and the procedural I, I part of that is. I did reach out to, uh, to the DA's office, Dan Dow. I wanted to make sure. I, 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 that's yeah. my understanding. Okay. And if I'm wrong, Mr. Dow, please correct <laughs> sure, yeah. me. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. But I, that keeps popping into my head. I keep wanting to ask somebody about that. Um, yeah, so uh, interestingly, too, with his two jury system, you know, sometimes one jury is in the courtroom, sometimes they're not. When do they, how do they make that decision? I guess it's based on the, uh, what's going to be presented, what evidence is being presented, because not all the evidence is relevant to uh, Paul Flores' right. case at, versus Ruben Flores. So there's no need to bring that a jury in for evidence that they're not gonna need to make their decision um, on the case. So I, I've talked a couple of times just in an interview situation with a local defense attorney about his views on some jury selection issues as well. And he has this idea even after his long career. And so I wanna mm -hmm. ask you after your long career, you know, how, do you find that jurors actually do a pretty good job? Do they follow those instructions? Do they take this seriously? Do they pay attention? Oh, they do. It's amazing, um, you know, when I uh, was a prosecutor and uh, you put a lot of extra hours in um, on the weekends after court, uh, because you're, even though you're in trial, your other work doesn't go away. Right, yeah. Uh, so you still have to do your other work. And, I, and you're thinking day and night on, okay, I need to argue this, I need to do this, I need to do that. Let me, uh, and you're talking to your investigators on, on uh, the witnesses and uh, you know what I need to prove and you know how to present this evidence, and it's always amazing, and I'll never ever, as long as I live, forget how when you would do a jury trial or I would do a jury trial, and the verdict would be guilty, and you would stand out waiting for the jurors to come out or they're waiting for you to come out because after a defendant's found guilty, then you have to pick a sentencing date and, and if the defendant's in custody, then you know they have to be transported. So there's a lot of work that has to take place um, after the jury has returned with a verdict. And it was always amazing to me that jurors would wait for you to talk to you about the case. And it was fascinating because what you thought was the evidence that was just rock solid of this is why this defendant's guilty. May and not be would, what they thought. It wasn't what they thought. Yeah. And they would say, oh no, this is what convinced me. And you're like, oh really? Yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> you know, so it was always interesting. And then the, you knew that you had a good jury. You knew you had a jury that was paying attention to the evidence because something that you n didn't even think was important, they put a great deal of importance on. And it was something so minor that they use that to, uh, to convict a defendant. Well, I just want to thank you so much. This has already been 30 minutes, so oh, that okay. was such a fun uh, chance to talk to you, and thanks for thank providing you. a little more perspective as well, and hopefully we can check with you again uh, yes. in the future. So, I'd yeah. love to. And we want to thank you as well for joining us for this uh, special broadcast, and uh, we will be doing this every week. Uh, we want to obviously thank my special guest, Mary Wofford, for joining us as well, and we do plan to bring you Facebook Live shows throughout the trials I just mentioned, and so we do hope that you'll join us next time again, and please add your questions. We know this one wasn't live, but it will be on Facebook. 
uh, add your questions and uh, we will try to get those answered as uh, completely as we can. Uh, and also you can find all of our coverage for this case on our website, ksby.com. Thanks again and we will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.